book of Esther is uh, extraordinary because God isn't mentioned at all in the book. And everyone has noticed this, and they call this the hiddenness of God. And what I, what I talk about in my book is the idea that it's not just that his name is hidden, but that actually he is hidden. That in the world of the book of Esther, there is no God. The person who's at the center of the book is this mad king, Ahasuerus, who has all the systems of his empire perfectly efficient, working beautifully, all these runners, it's a whole communication system. As soon as he issues an edict, it reaches the farthest reaches of the realm, like a fax system or internet system. Um, all the runners are immediately on the move. And, but what has he got to say? What he, he has nothing to say. It's a hollow center for, for the world of this book. 127 countries are included in this empire of the king. And then this king marries this Jewish girl, Esther, and she finds herself suddenly in a world that has nothing to do with the world she comes from. And God, strictly speaking, abandons her. That is, whatever God she might have had before, and we don't hear about that, she now finds herself in the world of, of the king. And in that world, there is nothing for her to do other than to be a satellite of a king who clearly hasn't any great love of women. He managed to execute, on very, on very small excuse, he managed to ex execute his previous wife. And there is Esther, forbidden to say who she is, and forbidden in the end even to meet her uncle Mordechai, who is her teacher and her mentor and the person who brought her up. She's an orphan. And at the crucial moment when Mordechai wants her to, to risk her life and to go into the king and to ask for compassion for the Jewish people, Esther has nothing to go on at all. Mordechai sends messages to her through a servant but he actually doesn't come to face her face to face. And so she's deprived of even that sense of the face of the person who is most familiar to her, who is her guide, who stands in for God, in a sense, in her world. And she is, strictly speaking, on her own. And he says to her in his message, Mordechai says to her, who knows if it wasn't for this moment that you became queen, that this is your crucial moment, this is the moment of providence. But what's so poignant about this is the expression, who knows? That is, he can't tell her for sure, you know, this is your moment. Just seize it and go in there and all will be well. He uses the expression, mi yodea, who knows, which is a very Jewish expression. Who knows? <laughs> You've got to have the, the appropriate <laughs> gesture. Um, who knows means it could be that it will turn out like this. I can imagine this might be the providential meaning of your story, but there's no guarantees. There is no way anyone can know, and you are actually risking your life. And there's nothing I can do to assure you that all will be well. And she, against all odds, goes in to the king, knowing very well, for instance, not, not even the plot is in her favor, for instance, that the king has not summoned her for 30 days. She throws in that little detail. And if the king hasn't summoned her for 30 days, if you think of the Arabian Nights kind of scenario that you have here, that means he's no longer interested. There are other women in the harem, and she's out, actually, at this point. If she hasn't been summoned for 30 days, perhaps he's not interested, and she's going to appear there in the court, and he is not going to stretch out his scepter to her, and she will die on the spot. Things don't look good. It's not as if the story has been rolling triumphantly towards its closure, and she can feel confident that it was all for this. Instead, what she has is a hidden god. And she cries out, according to the Talmud, she does pray to God, and what she cries to God is in the words of Psalm 22, um, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And that's the sense of the hidden God, the God who isn't there when you need him, in terms of immediate courage and confidence, and at the same time, the great yearning for God, and the sense of a connection with God, and asking, why have you abandoned me? You. That is, I'm still talking to you, and I want to know why aren't you more there for me? And I think that's a very poignant and strong example of how the modern Jew has to live in his world, her world. Because Esther stands as, she is the heroine who lives at a time beyond the early period of miracles and prophecy and immediate presence of God. 
she lives in the time of the exile already. It's, it's, it's moving into that, that post-biblical period. And she has to act as, a, as an example somewhere to people who live in this period, how to speak to a God, how to live with a God who is very largely hidden, and how to search for that God, how to quest for him when he's not actually obtruding himself on you. He's not actually making it absolutely unequivocal that he's there. And that's the heroism, I think, of Esther. It's a kind of quiet heroism. And she does survive, and her people do survive. But I think the really heroic moment is the moment when, against the odds, she goes into the king, goes into his chamber, without any assurances.